In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. We had two different passages marked, one in the Gospel book, the other in the bulletin, both of them from the same section of John, but one without the other would have been incomplete. That's why I gave you two different readings from the same Gospel. Never said that I haven't done anything good for you. <laughs> now, a couple of interesting things before this passage. Jesus comes to Bethany and Martha runs to him. And you heard the interaction between the two of them. If you would have been here, my brother would be alive. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes, I believe in the resurrection on the last day. I am the truth, the way, and the life, etc. Then Martha goes home and tells Mary, the master is here. And Mary runs, and you heard the interaction between the two of them. As soon as Jesus sees Mary weeping, Jesus says, take me to where you have buried him. They go to the tomb, and he raises Lazarus. All quite dramatic and quite sad and quite moving. I love that phrase, Jesus wept. Some of the English translations of the one you have in your hands says, and Jesus began to weep. Four words for what in Greek is one word, wept. Jesus wept. Jesus was overcome with emotion. Yet all of this could have been prevented. Huh. Let me explain. Jesus is north. Had just barely escaped Jerusalem. The Jews are trying to arrest him. He barely escaped with his life. He makes it all the way up to Galilee. When he hears a report that Lazarus has died, the one you love has fallen asleep. Translation, he's dead. He tells the disciples, this illness of his does not lead to death. And he remains where he was for four days before he comes down. Now he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He knew what they were telling him. If he would have come immediately, perhaps he would have interacted with Lazarus before Lazarus died. Why wait four days? He could have prevented this. He stayed awake for four days before he came down to Lazarus' family. Well, the disciples, one of them asks him, well, you know, he's dead. And Jesus says, but for your sake, for your sake, I have allowed this to happen, that you see the glory of God manifested. He wants to use this experience of death in Lazarus to make a powerful point, which is that those who believe he is the Messiah will have eternal life. But he wants to make sure that there is no doubt at all that Lazarus is dead. According to Jewish tradition, when a person dies, their soul hovers around the body for about three days. Hovers around the body. In fact, the soul kind of visits places where the person used to live. And in some cases, it appears to beloved ones they see him and in some cases that's how they know he or she is dead because it appears to them they see the person the soul hovers around the body and the places the body inhabited for about three days according to Jewish tradition the soul leaves the body and the known world of the person at the end of the third day by the fourth day there is no doubt in anybody's mind that the person is dead and the soul has left the body. This is conclusive evidence, conclusive evidence that the person is truly dead. In fact, as the King James Bible says, he stinketh. By the fourth day, not only is he totally dead, but the soul has left the body and he has begun to decompose. It is at this point that Jesus looks up to heaven and tells his father, thank you for having heard me. Now, 
for listening to me now, but for having heard me. Jesus knew what was about to happen. Thank you for having heard me. And then he invites Lazarus to come out, and Lazarus comes out. This is a powerful point that Jesus is trying to make here, which is that those who believe that he is the truth, the way, and the life, as he told Martha, will have eternal life forever. Why? Because we have eternity coursing through our veins. Because through Christ, the Messiah, death does not have the last word, and there is a tomorrow waiting for us when today is done. Death is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning of a story. Let me give you a bit of a metaphor from the world of tapestry. I love tapestry and carpets, things you, you stand on. And one of my favorites comes from a uh, uh, Mexican uh, Aztec rug that I once saw that had one layer of beautiful red followed by a layer of beautiful yellow and a layer of beautiful green and a layer of beautiful caramel and color after color after color for an impressively long tapestry. Our life provides one of those lines in the tapestry of life. We are here for a reason and we make our contribution using the example of musicians. Life is a symphony and we all provide a note. And without that note, the symphony is not complete. So our life on this earth is pregnant with eternity, pregnant with possibility. But beyond that, because we are Christians, not some of these uh, other religions that believe that eternity is, the, pro is, is, is the, the advancement of the genes and the history tradition. So as long as you have children and grandchildren, you will always be alive. That is true. But beyond that, we're Christians. We provide to this beautiful tapestry of life, we provide a note to this great symphony of life, but when we die, we join the eternal one. We join God himself. We go to Jesus' own presence. I go to prepare a place for you. We'll join that place for Jesus, which in the Gospel of John is a relationship as much as it is a place. We become one with God, and we will dwell with God. One day, the tapestry will be complete. And on that day, the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven and will be joined to this earth, and God will right all the wrongs of the world, and death will disappear forever, and God will clear the tears from, my, uh, from our eyes, and he will remove the shame and the guilt from our souls. And that day we will become one with God and the tapestry will be complete and we will be one in the presence of God. So we are here to celebrate and to remember folks who have died, folks who have died, but folks who in many ways are still with us, folks who in many ways have contributed to the great tapestry of our lives and have made it possible for us to be here. I, here this moment, have Spanish from Spain blood and Indian blood. And I, who am a male, have my mother's eyes and my great-grandmother's smile. We're all interconnected. We're part of the great fabric of life. We're part of the same symphony. And soon, we will join that symphony on the other side of the River Jordan with those we love. And that will not be a catastrophe. That actually will be a celebration, will be a coming home, will be a restoration of the life God had determined for us from the beginning of creation. So I, for one, I'm not afraid of dying because I know what awaits me and I know that eternity it's a gift given to us at birth and at baptism, and that one day we will join those who have died in the presence of God himself. 
now, there are many other ways in which we remember people's lives. I have a small tradition that every time I come to any item in this church that is marked with a little plaque that says, to the memory of God and in thanksgiving for George Smith or whoever the name is, I always stop and I pray for George Smith and I give thanks to God for this one person whose memory has been celebrated through this little plate. And I invite all of you today, sing the melody they left us to sing every time something or someone reminds you of the one you're celebrating today. Stop for a second, breathe deeply, close your eyes, and give thanks to God that for a little bit of time, God gave us this person to be with us and to make our life better. And let's give thanks to God that we're here, and let's prepare our hearts and our souls to join our loved ones when the day comes. Because death for the Christian is never a tragedy. It is always the beginning. It is always an end that deals to a beginning, leads to a beginning, a beginning that will go on forever and will never end. So today, let's pause. Let's give thanks for life. Let's give thanks for those who have given us life. Let us give thanks for those who have contributed to the tapestry to which we are contributing our own line today. Let us give thanks for the great symphony of life as we continue to provide that one note, that one little, symp one little melody that will make the symphony what God intended for the symphony to be.